All right, let's get started. Uh, I'm, my name is Richard Clark. I'm an SRE consultant with a company called Crafty Penguins up in Chilliwack, British Columbia. Uh, SRE is a fancy term made by Google for jack of all trades. Uh, software developer and assistant administrator. Um, my contact details are there. Uh, interesting, I used to go by C Dick Code, but I just gave up. I was too, if you have the word Dick anywhere in your name, it just becomes a mess. You know, Dick, <laughs> Richard, C J Dick and Jane books, it all worked out perfectly, except no one will let me register anywhere. We're going to talk about Proxmox. Um, who's heard of Proxmox? A whole bunch of people. Who has used Proxmox? Some other people. Excellent. Then, um, I'm sure you all know that Proxmox is an amazing laundry detergent. <laughs> and today I'm going to show you guys in my seminar how you can make all kinds of money selling Proxmox door to door. <laughs> and before you ask, the coupon for the knife set will be handed out at the end of the presentation. No. So, Proxmox is a manager for uh, KVM and LXE containers. So let's do a little bit of background on that stuff. Um, what is a hypervisor? So hypervisor, software, firmware, hardware, creates and runs multiple isolated virtual guest machines on one host machine. Um, the whole point is you have a, a single server box and you want to run a bunch of stuff on it. Um, to maximize your hardware, a uh, hypervisor and a virtual machine container is the best way to go. Um, it also provides isolation for various concerns, so you can have one process isolated from the other one. That's not necessarily something you need a hypervisor and a KVM for, but <clears throat> it's a good benefit. Some commercial ones, uh, VirtualBox, I'm sure most people have used VirtualBox. Um, there's a whole company built around VMware's ESX and their hypervisor. Uh, under Linux, we have the Zen project, we have the KVM project, and Windows has a hypervisor of their own called Hyper-V. Um, Let's talk about the components that we care about. Oh, wait, I forgot to mention the two other technologies we'll be covering. They're not exactly hypervisors in a technical sense, um, but they do provide an isolation for guest containers. Um, it's sort of achieving the same goals you want to do with a virtual machine. Uh, LXC and OpenVZ. KVM, uh, kernel-based virtual machine. This is a hypervisor built into the Linux kernel. Provides emulated hardware, network, uh, video, disks, everything for a guest operating system. Um, it can handle most operating systems you're going to throw at it. Uh, you can put Windows under there, Linux, various BSDs, OS X if you get creative. Um, whatever you want under there. To the guest, it just looks like, an, like it's on a normal computer. Um, this is probably the one that most people are familiar with and most people use. The, it can be a bit slow. Um, KVM also has things called para-virtualized drivers, which make the driver emulation layer a bit better if there's a host that supports them. And we'll talk about that a bit later. You manage with command line tools, um, all dark place stuff. Uh, VRSH is a common tool to manage a whole bunch of different uh, technologies in the space. And there's various, uh, various overlay managers um, to go on top of that. Uh, Vert Manager, all kinds of different ones to manage your KVM machines because the native implementation command line tools aren't necessarily that friendly. The other component we want to talk about is LXC containers. Uh, these are it's operating system level virtualization. That's the, the term. Basically, um, it's everything beyond the kernel, so all the user space, and that's what gets jailed into a sandbox. On Linux, LXC on Linux is a low-level system that uses the C groups and isolated namespaces built into the kernel to provide a guest, situ a guest environment. Now, because it's everything after the kernel, that means every guest has to share the same kernel. So you can only run Linux-based guests. Um, you manage it with the LXC command line tools. You can use VRSH as well. And various other third-party tools can come in to help manage this as well. Um, again, it's a very low-level system. You compile stuff on top of this to help you manage it. Um, there's a little company called Docker. They make a tool that goes on top of LXC to manage it. They're doing pretty good. Um, and then Canonical also has one called LXD. 
which does the same kind of thing as Docker. It's just more focused on doing containers with a um, more of a full guest operating system, whereas Docker's heading towards the 12-factor pattern, you know, running one single binary is in at zero. LXD is more turned and set up to running little small operating systems. So, uh, do we use KX, KVM for our needs, or do we use LXC? Uh, they both have different use cases. Which one do we pick? Uh, let's look at them. KVM, um, if you need to run a non-Linux operating system, you run on Windows, you want to run Solaris, you want to run Mac, something else in there, you're going to go for KVM. Uh, you need to use a different or custom kernel for some reason. You can't use the kernel that's on the host. You're making some new one or you're debugging it. This is where you're going to go for KVM. You need a virtual video card. Uh, for instance, you want to run a desktop GUI. You're going to do that under KVM. It's slower than other types of container technology. Um, but as I said, the parallel virtualized drivers work. It's just an extra step you have to go through in the guest to add those things. LXC. Uh, is very fast because you're pretty much running the same code as you would just isolated and jailed up by the kernel. So it's, it's near line performance with just running the stuff bare. Uh, it does provide you the isolation that you want out of the whole point of doing this stuff. You get to isolate the OS, the user level stuff underneath so that you can treat it like a separate system. You can do your, app, your upgrades on there separately. Uh, you can do your configuration. The networking configuration can be totally different. Um, you don't have to install a whole bunch of tools on one attack surface. So your security is a little better. Um, for instance, if you're going to have a, a, proc, a box that's just doing your mail routing, all that gets installed is PostFix and just the stuff that's on there, or whatever your favorite mail client is. Um, only Linux, uh, and only the same kernel. Okay. And there's no video card emulation. Now, a little star there because some Crazy people have managed to get LXE containers sharing like your NVIDIA card. So literally you can run an entire desktop operating system in the LXE container and then switch to it with all, like go Alt F7 for your main desktop and Alt F8 for your other desktop and go on and go on and on. Um, I just can't get my Red Hat. I can't get my NVIDIA drive to work, period. So and you, can <laughs> use, you can use a remoting protocol or whatever mm -hmm. if you want. Yeah. Yeah, you can use it like you, you can put in a virtual X Windows drive or things like that. Um, but it's not actually going to use your normal video card. Uh, but again, there are people who are managing to do this. So, do we use KVM or do we use LXC? Why not both? <laughs> All right, why not both? Uh, so, you have, your op you have your workstation, your host, and it's got a whole bunch of stuff on you. You want to run LXC and KVM. Both of those products have two different types of backing stores, like where the storage goes from, how you set that up. They have different bootstrap methods, how you're going to get the initial product going. Different network configurations, different console access, different configuration for the resources, different ways to monitor how the units are doing, different management to start them, to stop the recycling, to back them up, to move them, to remove them, on and on, all kinds of different tools. Earthquakes and volcanoes, the dead rising from the grave, human sacrifices, dogs and, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria, four years of darkness up upon us. And that's how you manage it the normal way. It's horrible, you go with all, everything's command line tools, they're all different. And there's the darkness. So, why am I giving this talk? Um, it's about Proxmox. Yeah, you remember from Proxmox? It's a handy package that will let you manage your KVM and your LXC containers, all in one space, all with one UI. Um, drop your ESX, there's no point in using it anymore. vSphere, don't use it. Proxmox, all you ever need. Proxmox, it's been going for 10 years this year. Um, I started using it about seven years ago when version 1.9 came out. It's now at 5.1. Um, back then it used open VZ containers instead of LXC, because LXC was just a, uh, was just a dream. Uh, it's a full management system for KVM and LXC technologies, all in one. Uh, similar kind of actions to VMware's vSphere, Zen Center, etc. So it's all the things you'd ever want, you could possibly think you need to do, is probably baked into this utility. It is open source. Now there is an enterprise support subscription model, and when we do it in the demo, we'll do the install, they have a, a little nag screen that comes up and says, hey, give us some money. Um, because that's the only way they make their money. 
but otherwise it is full open source. Uh, rich UI available over HTTPS. Uh, you manage KVM and LXC all in that same UI. Um, there's a nice integrated virtual console for your KVM instances. Makes it easier to, easier and to use for installing Windows, things like that. Um, and clustering is all baked in. So if you want to have a whole bunch of these Proxmox all together and working together, it all just comes in the package. <coughs> so let's dig in and see some of the actual feature sets. So again, rich HTML-based UI for KVM and LXC management. It's all one thing. There's no proprietary management tools needed. You're not going to have to install some binary that doesn't work on your workstation or your operating system so that you can manage your, <coughs> your virtual machines. All you need is to get to a web page. Um, you can use LXC when you want the fastest possible isolation. You can use KVM when you want the full um, virtual emulation. Needed, you want to run non-Linux. They all stay in the exact same workspace. Now they're all managed very similar. Again, as I mentioned, it's open source. It's based off Debian, uh, currently at uh, Debian 9. Um, underneath, it's just Linux. So everything you want to use is there, just like you'd expect it to be. It's not a separate proprietary operating system underneath. You want to use Vim to edit your config files? Use Vim to edit your config files. You want to use Emacs to edit your config files? Use Emacs to edit your config files. I don't know why you would, because you probably have a full KVM LXC manager in, baked into your Emacs. But if you want it, you can use it. Um, all the tools you're familiar with using for debugging, they're all just there. Setting up your networking, it's just the same way you'd normally set up your networking. Granted, it is Debian, so if you're coming from Red Hat, you got to configure <coughs> things a little differently. Uh, it's easy to install. Slap in a repository, add a key, app get installed, up you go. Well, it's a little bit more difficult than that. We'll go over that, but in general, that's it. Um, it's not a light community edition, this open source version. Everything's in the package, out of the box. Uh, backups, firewall management, uh, all kinds of storage options, clustering. Uh, live migration. These are features you'd be paying huge amounts of money for in any other product. These are all just come baked in. So it makes it great for your home lab or your personal work. Um, you get to run various operating systems for training, experimentation, all on your own machine, and it starts as free, as in beer. Right? Um, with all the features, there's nothing you're going to miss. So it's a great thing to start with and great for home lab. Lots of backing store file system support. Um, so you've got your KVM containers, you've got your LXC containers, they all need storage somewhere. If you want to be able to migrate them from one machine to another, like say you have a cluster of these Proxmox and hypervisors, you need to have a network support for your file system. So you want to have that stored on the network somewhere so the next box can take it and pick it up and run it from there. Uh, LVM over iSCSI, uh, direct iSCSI targets itself, NFS, Ceph, ClusterFS, all baked in management for the product. So, I mean, great for that, for local, um, so local storage, uh, LVM or any block device that, be, that looks like a block device, so a fiber channel, DRDB, whatever you want to use. Uh, you can use right on the directory in the host as a bare file system, so you can, it'll mount it that way. Uh, now that's for the LXC, can, LXC stuff only. Um, ZFS, if you have a couple terabytes of RAM in your server, go for ZFS as well, baked in the product. <laughs> Uh, you get all the cool features of snapshotting, etc. Clustering for high availability uh, built into the product. You can cluster these things. Each one's a map. It's a multi-master. Every node in your cluster is a master. Um, they all have the same configuration. It's done through um, uh, CoralSync and sort of a virtual fuse user space for the configuration database. Does it set up and manage like the set stuff, or does it use an existing set? Cluster you have. Uh, I believe right now you have to you have to build a Ceph cluster, but it'll integrate with it in the UI. I haven't used the Ceph stuff much myself. Uh, a colleague at work has set up a, a large cluster with it, but he's not here. Um, yeah, so clustering uh, live migration. So if you have the cluster set up, you have some kind of shared storage. You can take your running KVM. It will suspend it, take a snapshot of memory, turn move that snapshot of memory to the other host bring it up there and the machine will come out of suspend. So it's as if it was just never stopped running. Um, snapshots baked into the UI as well. If your underlying file system supports snapshotting of some format. Um, if it doesn't, it goes all the way down to it will stop, take an image of your, your OS, 
um, and then turn it back up. Uh, that leads into the backup services it has as well. So we'll use snapshots and all that stuff to manage backups. You can set up daily, weekly schedules, have the storage go somewhere else, all kinds of cool stuff for your images. And of course, you don't have to use the UI all the time. You can drop down and you can use a CLI for most of the stuff that's in there. Um, and it is a RESTful API, so if you want to write code against it to turn up your KVMs, things like that, you can do that as well. And so much more and more. Every day they keep adding new features. So how do we install it? Uh, easiest way, uh, download the ISO installer from Proxmox. Uh, it's just like installing any other operating system. It's very opinionated though. Um, it's going to take over your box. It's going to set up the networking. It does everything for you. It's all nice and ruddy to go. Um, but you don't necessarily get as much control over the initial build process. So I, because it's so much easier to just, or it's still easy to do it just run of normal Debian, I just do that method. And that's the one I've been using for years now. Um, just get yourself a Debian 9 box up and running. Um, there's instructions on their wiki how to do it. Just Google for Debian and Proxmox. You'll get the, the install instructions. Uh, essentially, add a repository. Um, same stuff you normally see. Add the GPG key for the repository. Set up bridge networking. Now, the newer version of the Proxmox, you can actually configure the bridge networking in the UI as well, but I like to do it in advance. So the bridge network is, as these virtual machines are coming up, they're going to go to a virtual bridge, and that's how they're going to communicate in and out to your actual Ethernet interfaces. Set that up. Um, add the IP host name. One thing with Proxmox is you need to have um, a static IP and the host name registered when you first install it, and you sort of need to stick with that. Now, you can change it later, but it's a real pain. Um, this is mostly to support the clustering operations later. And once you've gone and formed a cluster, you better really want it to be that way. So know that your IPs are going to be that way, um, because it's a pain to change it around. You have to take the cluster down, remove members, change the IPs. Just, yeah, don't do it. Build a new cluster. Um, all that, then reboot, take effect, uh, update your repository. Disk upgrade all the packages because uh, Proxmox will over will provide new versions of some packages that are in the base repository. Uh, if anything, they have a customized version of TAR um, that helps do certain things for their backup system. And app get install, Proxmox, postfix, because they like postfix. And open iSCSI because if you don't, certain parts complain, even if you're not really using the SCSI. How do I use it? Well, I'm going to try messing the resolution to show that. Uh, so I, in my home land, or my home uh, lab, I have three Proxmox clusters. Um, I use it for all kinds of different things, uh, various operating systems. So each of the boxes I have PFSense, so I'm using FreeBSD uh, for the firewall, uh, high availability setup there. Um, I have Kubernetes, I run Kubernetes. So the, the blue ones are your KVMs in my setup here. So I have a, a KVM for Kubernetes, three of them, that forms a Kubernetes cluster, so I can do Kubernetes experiments. Um, there are some people who have been able to make um, do KVM or do Kubernetes clusters shell like Docker in Docker, um, and you can actually do it with Proxmox. It's a little bit it's tricky, but you can run the Kubernetes nodes as LXC containers, um, which is kind of <coughs> cool. But it's it's a work in progress. Um, that's what I set up. Uh, I have on my server. I run mail server, so I got. Lightweight containers for Postfix, uh, Dovecot, Anavis for the spam. Um, I have them all isolated. So I don't just have one mail server or one mail instance. I take it, I start working just like the 12-factor pattern for Docker, just not to such an extreme. One container does Postfix, that's its job. The other container is the IMAP, that's its job, and that's what's in there, just imap -y stuff. Um, another one does the spam, that's its job, and they talk back and forth to one another. So I can upgrade and work on the AMAVIS container independently of all the other ones. It's the advantage of doing this virtualization. Um, and then a whole bunch of other runs I can just randomly throw up as I need them. Um, switch, VLAN stuff, blah, 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 blah. Hooks it all together. That's all magic secret sauce. Uh, DNS, I run a salt stack server. Um, Windows boxes, uh, Edge for testing ID stuff. Um, the kids always, every so often, want some game from Steam, and they don't happen to have a Linux um, game server for it, so I got a Windows container there to run their game servers so they can play. 
um, a boot server, and that helps, um, wrong icon there, that helps turn up other clusters. It bootstraps it, TFTP, things like that. Um, HA proxies and Jenkins and GitLab. Um, this is all connected to a NAS, so I can move the containers around. So this is sort of some examples you can use. So there's just three boxes. They're only, they're only 16 gigs of RAM in each one of these boxes. But leveraged together and combined, I got a good platform for doing all kinds of experimentation. So this is great for home lab. All right. Time for a demo. <laughs> all right. So I got this laptop here. It's old. Um, old laptop. It's about 10 years old. It's got 8 gigs of RAM on it, though, and a pretty decent drive. I have installed Debian 9 on it, just Debian 9. And last night, on the really bad hotel Wi-Fi, I was able to pull down all the packages in advance for Proxmox to install. So let's see if this works. Oh, oh, no, no. Maybe if I drag it over. No, 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 no. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, I got to log into the box. I am logging in just as root, just to make my life easier. What's your password? Um, password. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, try to remember. 101? Yes. All right. So, uh, let me bring up my other notes here. <coughs> so, I'm going to do what I said. First is install the repository. So, there's the repository. I echo it out, echo it out to the repository storage. Done. Then I'm going to get the key. And I'll see if my routing works. No. Mm. Quick fix. Okay. So I got those two in there. Now I said I need to set up bridging. Now if I remember properly, I think I did this at home already, or in the hotel. Bridge utils, already in. So then we need to set up the networking for the bridge. Now if you're used to Debian, this is all just normal part and parcel stuff. Just a little bigger. Where's the mouse? It's moving. There it's moving. Nice and small. There we go. So, typically, if you're going to be installing this, a, a normal case for me, um, you might just have one machine um, that you dedicated server that you're using somewhere. Um, all that's got into it is your WAN connection, bare the internet. Uh, you want to make a separate bridge internally for all the guests. You want to make a fake LAN for this environment. Um, I have a server at um, Rupprise Hosting down in Seattle. Um, if you're ever looking for dedicated servers, good and cheap. Um, again, they've got one WAN connection comes in, I've got a bunch of static IPs on it. I don't want to have all my stuff running on that one network interface. I want to isolate it back, normal practices, you want a LAN version. So that's what this VMBR is going to go for. I call it whatever I want. It's just traditionally called the NBR and index, so zero. Uh, normal bridging setup for Debian. 
Uh, bridge oh, ports equal yeah. none because there is no physical device that this is bridging. It's just it's becoming the bridge, and it's going to, all these container machines are going to talk in through that. All right. Um, and as I said, the IP wants to be set. Let's see if I did this already. See in hosts. Yes. So it's that normally when you install Debian, you're going to get the 127.0.0.0.1.1. One. And that will be also to localhost or the host name. We want to go in and put in the actual static IP of this box. So I put in the IP of the internal LAN network because that's going to be probably static. Uh, the, uh, the place where I rent it from, I may wind up getting a new WAN IP at some point, so I don't want to put it into there. And uh, host names, and that's done. And that's it. App get upgrade and dist upgrade. Update and upgrade. Can you run an IP adder on that? Yeah, I sure can. Well, no, I can't. I've lost it all now. There we go. Fingers up right, please. There's a couple there. So this, this one here, that's my, you can think of that as being the WAN interface. That's this cable going from this into this laptop. All right. And then VMDR, that's the internal WAN. All right. So I would now at some point set up a firewall in here, firewall this stuff off, allow routing and NAT out from here to here so that my containers could get out. So the way you have it set up right now, they wouldn't be able to get out though, right? Um, that's correct, yes. I'll have to install a masquerading rule. Uh, didn't get that far in the demo last night at the hotel. All right. Where was I? The app get update. Update, upgrade. So if you're not familiar with Debian, update's going to go check all the repositories, grab all the indexes, see what packages we've got. And dist upgrade's going to give me the latest, greatest of all the packages that I could possibly get right now. Breaking everything in the process. Bang and bang, better than done. All right. So this again, just a normal Debian box. And here we go. Let's get Proxmox. As you see, it's a good thing I did all this in advance. Let's see it works. So while that's going... What is it about the way that the default way that their installer does it does things that you don't really care? I don't. About? Again, maybe it's changed in the last two years. <laughs> it probably has, and it's probably a lot better. I just never looked back. Um, but in the past, it took care. It did the file system. It's like going into Debian and saying, "Partition this drive for me. Go for it." Well, I don't want that. You know, I want a certain partition. I want I want the root to be a certain thing, and I want to build my own LVMs after that, or I want to do RAID or something. It didn't let you do RAID. Right, unless you want to do exactly their pre-templated RAID. Um, you can sort of think of losing, using a pre-seed system with only a few things you get to pick. Um, but if you're doing to try something like ZFS and everything, it takes care of all that hassle for you. So definitely worth trying. Uh, again, they like PostFix. That's just what they want to use. You don't have to use PostFix, but I just toe the line because uh, I don't mind using PostFix. So that's just the normal PostFix config comes up. Any questions? What's the dedicated server place in Seattle you like? Reprise hosting. Um, low end box usually has ads for them. And what's the other website? Web hosting. It's a forum. Um, they have a, a vendor forum, and people are always trying to post stuff. Um, I've also used Joe's data center. Um, <laughs> That sounds really funny. <coughs> Real good cheap things and awesome service. Uh, both these guys are great great service providers. You know, they'll, they'll hook you up a cart real quick. Um, reprise, they actually have a VPN you VPN into, and then you get the IPMI on your box. And $50 a month, 32 gigs of RAM, um, 24 cores. You know, it's not bad. Go to the laptop, go. So I have an architectural question, yeah. a little bit about Proxmox. So normally on like a, a Zen-based, you know, um, hypervisor setup, you know, it would, uh, you know, load up a uh, Dome Zero, which would be the management controller, and manage Zen, and mm -hmm. then there'd be a bunch of enlightened DOM use. Now using KVM, 
it's a little bit different in the fact that the uh, DOM0 is also the hypervisor itself because KVM runs under the Linux kernel. Yep. Is there a way, using Proxmox, that you could kind of separate the DOM0 from the hypervisor, kind of like the way that you separate Zen from the DOM0 that runs Linux? I, again, I'm not super knowledgeable with that stuff. Um, I used Van, Zen a couple of years back. Um, I believe, now I could be totally wrong, but I believe that KVM runs more like Zen now um, over the last three years. That was, as far as I know, that was a big issue with KVM in the past, um, that it's not a ring zero, or the ring zero separation. Uh, I think that's architecturally gone now, I but I don't KVM know. KVM was ring zero before, but I didn't know if they got into ring data one. I, I don't know. But, good question. Thanks. Between the subscription and non-subscription uh, repo, like how much of a difference? Um, their, their, their tagline is that it's more vetted. Uh, what that means is that the chain, it goes from test. So as they're developing new products, it goes into test branch first. And then it goes from test branch into stable branch. And then it goes from stable into uh, enterprise. So enterprise is just a slower chain and they're just gradually pushing stuff out. All the people running it in the open source version are the guinea pigs who are gonna hit the stable version. It's already gone through test and they're mostly vetted, but occasionally something may go wrong. Now you can just bypass that by not upgrading so often. I had a question about uh, highly available block devices. Like if you have three nodes and you didn't have them highly available, you know, NAS or something, um, in like Kubernetes world, there's stuff like Rook, which is just, you know, whatever, uh, orchestrator yep. for, uh, for Ceph. So does this out of the box let you set up some highly available block device amongst three nodes? Again, I haven't done it myself. Um, you'd have to check. I think you have to form the Ceph cluster first. Um, and I think there's, I'm pretty sure there's guides on their wiki on doing it. Um, but other than that, I think it just allows you provision it. Like it will work with Ceph to create new block devices for the VMs that you create. But there has to be that initial infrastructure. I don't know how far along we are, but we'll move on to something else. All right, set up the network. That's in the background here. Come on. There. No. We set up the network, we installed Proxmox, uh, rebooted across our fingers, it all worked. Logged in, explain that. Okay, so we got to log in. I tested this on a slightly faster machine with an SSD, so. We're down with letter G's. Okay. Let me bring up. Let's get you into one. So when that's all done, you log in. Yay, Proxmox! All right. This looks so much better on a large screen. There's so much real estate. All right. So this is a hardware platform um, out in the cloud, or out in the dedicated server space. I threw some stuff up. Uh, this is Proxmox. So over here, we have a, a tree of your stuff, your nodes at the top. This is only one node cluster. All the containers listed below. You can see there's slightly different icons here. So those are the LXC containers. And that one there is the KVM container. Um, another notes here, another view based on what you picked over there. So we're in search right now, so we can search for containers. Some extra buttons up here for doing shutdown, shell actions, bulk actions, create stuff up above there. There's my mouse. All right, so let's go select the hypervisor, select a summary. Here's a summary of the running processes on the machine, all the health of it, how much RAM we're using, how much hard drive, 
swap, blah, 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 some nice fancy graphs. Everyone likes graphs. All right, we can get to a shell on the actual box. Maybe, I don't know if I've tried this. Oh, amazing. I never use this, but there it is. So now I'm actually on the box, shelled in through the web page. And the shell, system actions, network setup. So this is the, as far as the hypervisor is concerned, the networking setup. This is where I said you can go in, you can make new bridges, all that kind of <coughs> stuff right in the UI. Uh, main thing we care about are the containers. You can pick any one of these containers, have a look at what it's doing, how its health is. Let's have a quick pop back. See how we're doing? Oh, we're up. All right, let's see how this new box. Proxmox is over HTTPS. And we're putting an IP of our server. Do you need to reboot it? Let's find out. 192.168. Uh, no, no, called something else. 10, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. And it runs on port 8006. I don't have an SSL cert in here, so it just is the, the snake oil one. This is unsafe. This is unsafe. <laughs> Uh-oh. There we go. If you type this is unsafe, you don't have to click on it. All right. <coughs> <coughs> root and whatever root's password is and there's your nag hey give us some money that's it that's all you can go hack this out of pearl if you want next update just gonna come back in just say okay say like thanks think of it as thanks button and there it is all right, let's flip back. How's our time doing? Oh, not too much time. So let's flip back and show us some actual Proxmox stuff. So that's the install. Wasn't too hard, was it? No. Uh, where am I? Up here. Go. All right. So we're back in here. Um, KVM instance. So here's a KVM instance. We can go up here, go to the console. Find a way. It's over here. So there's your KVM instance. You've got the full virtual video card running there. This is a new Ubuntu install, uh, something I just kicked off. Um, we can close off that. This is a Windows one. Uh, right now it's grayed out, the box is stopped. This is all in the web page. Start it up. Down below on the bottom, this is the status bar section. It gives you all the actions that are happening throughout the cluster. Again, this is just one machine, so it's nothing terribly exciting. So it's come up. We can go in here, go to console on it. It's over here. Comes a little do that. Oh, there we go. Windows. So you got Windows on there. I'm not going to go for putting a Mac on here. It's just a nightmare. Um, but again, you put whatever you want on. And it's fairly easy to get the stuff going. Um, Linux KVMs are fairly simple. If you want to build a new container, let's go to create VM. Up comes a dialog box. Uh, right here is where you pick a node. So if you have a couple of nodes in your cluster, you get to pick which one you want to deploy this on. Any one of those, you can hit the web page at 8006, and you can control the whole cluster from any one of those machines. Uh, so I'll pick which node you want it on, give it some kind of ID, give it some kind of name. Do you have to specify a node? What if you just want it to float around as resources? has to start somewhere. Uh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't balance. Can yeah. you proxy load balance to that 40,006? Yes. Uh, in my setup, I have um, an HA proxy running in a container. So traffic <laughs> comes, gets IP tables, routes it stuff through to HA proxy, HA proxy routes it back through to Proxmox interface, which is not available publicly anywhere. And HA Proxy does the SSL certificate, so I don't have to have the HTTPS error. And then there's other things I can override. Do you, do you have a contingency plan for when the HA Proxy guest goes down? Um, IPMI, yeah. <laughs> and you could do HA, high available HA Proxy, you, gotta, you know, throw another note on, experiment with that. 
Um, where is the operating system coming from? Uh, so we pick a storage. Um, right now, uh, there's only one storage that has the images on it. And I go pick an image I want. Let's throw in Windows, just to get exciting. And hard disk, we pick a hard disk. So this is where you specify your, your emulators. So we can go with SCSI. Again, the performance comes from using Vert IO. When you boot a Windows box, you want to use Vert IO, you have to get the ISO that has the Vert IO drivers for the networking and, and the hard and the storage and all that kind of stuff. Uh, where do I want to put it? Local, again, I've talked about the local file system, but we can also bring in, and I've already brought in, a LXC, or not LXC, a um, LVM partition. So there's just an LVM block, and that's where it's going to create new LVM logical volumes to host the data for this machine. Now put it there, give it some RAM. I don't know how much I got here, so let's just go 16 gig for now, or whatever I type there. What kind of CPUs do I want? Let's slap some cores on it. What kind of memory do I want? Again, there's a, a driver for, called for ballooning. So if you install that in, Windows can ask for more memory within a certain scope. Um, and other, other systems will support that as well. So that's kind of handy, but that's uh, 496. <coughs> Configure the networking. Again, this is where, how, what does this container get attached to? All right, so the MBR, I already made that, so it's just gonna put it on the LAN for now. In the future, for some reason, I wanted this box to have full external. I would have to take my external LAN port, convert that from a normal network config into a bridge config. The IP would still stay on there. And then I would give another networking device to this host. So it could now have full, dedicated outside access to that WAN card. But for now, I'm just going to keep it internal. Can you get multiple NICs? Yep. Yeah, I'll show you after bid this up. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Next. Done, finish. That's a lot easier than any other kind of thing you're going to get to making a KVM up and running, especially using normal KVM tools. Now, again, Vert, SH, and other things will help this off, but I can go make a container on the same box using similar technology, fill in the blanks. Container gets specified a bit more options because it'll actually go in and it will do the configuration for the IP address and for depending on what operating system you're using. All right, so that's building up. What did I call it? Is built. Start it. All right, so some talked about adding stuff. So I need to get, I go in the hardware tab here. Oh, don't kill me now. Oh, so close. But on that hardware tab, you can go in and add other network devices. You can add other disks. You just add whatever things you want to this virtual machine. Um, that's where you'd throw in the ISO for your drivers alongside your ISO for your installer. Can you do pass through there too? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, you can have a pass through a live CD-ROM onto it. Oh, came up. Hard disk. So want to add network device, whatever you want. Let's add that other CD drive. Pick storage. Oh, yes, I'm having internet troubles. All right. That's about as far as we're going to be able to get in the demo. Uh, questions? Does this play nice with live work? Uh, no. No. It doesn't use it no. at all. No. They use their own. Yeah, yeah, no, I I it doesn't use it. Exactly. If you run nice. if you turn, um, uh, Docker will run. Like I can run Docker on the, on the same guest as Proxmox, the same host as Proxmox. But I don't want LiveBird installed on a Proxmox because it's not going to coexist peacefully. I don't know. I haven't done it. But seeing as you can, it's not going to have a problem setting up the containers and using the same tools as LXC. And seeing as if you do LXC list, like actually install LXC, you wouldn't see the Proxmox containers in that space. So I think you could probably use LiveBird. You still have to install LXC. I mostly use LiveBird for KVM. Uh, KVM that KVM. might get a little messy. Yeah. Does it have an API though that you can automate creation of VMs and stuff? Uh, the REST API. So everything okay. you can do here, you can get through REST API. Nice. I mean, the web accessibility is just phenomenal. That's yeah. Awesome. And be, and again, I, you'll find yourself using containers just more and more. It's so lightweight, and you can probably do everything you really want in a container, and you just get to cram more and more of them on. Uh, you get uh, memory du duplication uh, out of that as well, I think. Um, yeah, great.
Have you ever had the desire to check out something else, like overt? I have not. Okay. Yeah. Someone will have to give a talk on it. Is there a place where you can download pre-built containers? Yes. Um, let's see if I can still do this. So we want to turn on a container. We have to get the container. So I was going to do that in the demo. Let's just have a look. Come on. Okay. Let's go back to the other tab. There we go. Product box data. Come on, come on. Expand out. Storage. Can't see it. It's this big. Summary. Where's storage? Content. Template. There we go. List of templates. So before you can do an LXC container, LXC bootstraps with a template. So you need to get a container. So you click the storage, hit find that content tab, and here comes a whole list of things you can that have already been templated out. Um, there's a whole bunch of pre-baked stuff in there, but basically you can run a Linux, Debian, CentOS, whatever you want. Um, there's all kinds of pre-built turnkey things, so turnkey WordPress, Tomcat, Apache, list goes on. Um, all the turnkey stuff. Uh, it's just a matter of going and picking that, download, and it'll start grabbing it. Well, it would if the internet worked. That's that now that we talked about. Oh. Doing something. Our status bar doing. So that's how you get containers in. Uh, you can build your own as well. Um, similar to building any LXC container, you've got to get that image in there. Yeah. What are the major advantages of Proxmox over, say, something like OpenStack? Uh, OpenStack... As a learning thing, OpenStack is a great thing to try, um, to use. Large enterprise is a great thing. Um, I think it's probably a bit of overkill if you have just three boxes in your home lab, or you have a small enterprise you want to set this stuff up. Um, but you know, definitely try OpenStack. Um, it's a good thing to learn. No. All right. So it's simplicity. Project. It's a simplicity thing. Yeah. Um, again, you could get really creative, and you could use Proxmox and make. Um, Docker, make KVM Kubernetes clusters and then install all your OpenStack components under the Kubernetes cluster. How far down can you go? And then export that back out to the bare metal nodes because you could, if you can run KVMs, like as you mentioned, if you could do vert SH on the host as well as doing Proxmox, then technically you could probably run the OpenStack components on there as well. There'd probably be some resource connotation because they wouldn't know who's everyone doing, but it'd be something to experiment with. Yeah. Anything else? Does it let you choose the CPU model that you pass to the guest, or does it just do like a host pass through? So I know if you're going to be trying to do nested virtualization, sometimes you run into needing to specify. Yeah. Um, I haven't had much luck with nested virtual. Uh, all the net internet's failing. I don't. There's a lot of controls in there. If you didn't see it when I was picking this for the stuff, I think just like PAE, um, that kind of stuff is the only things you get to turn on. I know you can, in KVM, modify CPU IDs so that you Yeah, and again, you, beyond this UI, you can go in. All these stuff, all these configurations are just a config file on the file system, and there's all kinds of extra options. Like if you want to, you make the LXC container, there's LXC options. Like if you want to um, um, make a non-jailed LXC container or give it privileged access, you can do that just by editing the config file and pass actual LXC uh, options to it. <coughs> I don't know if anybody's ever automated the import of a VMDK file or... It is documented. If the, the question was uh, automating, uh, getting VMDK into Proxmox, it is documented on their wiki. Um, you just take it, take the VMDK, it goes straight to a QCAL file, and then the QCAL file um, Proxmox can just use as a file. At some point, you probably want to um, take that and just do a DD of the QCAL or the VMDK straight to an LVM partition um, and use it that way. Because if you do QCAL, it's got to go through a file system layer first before it gets to the disk, where if you do LVM, it's sort of pretty direct performance-wise. All right. So outside the scope of Proxmox, but you sound like you would know, what's a good differentiator or indicator of when one should use containers versus KVM hosts? Uh, yes. My personal feeling, always use containers unless you need to use a KVM, because why not get the best performance you can? And Docker and Kubernetes are great tools, um, and at some point I foresee, probably in a couple of years, I probably wouldn't necessarily be needing Proxmox too much. Um, so this is maybe going out, uh, dying. 
I could probably run anything I want in Kubernetes right now. Docker, Docker, Docker. But it's not, it's not there yet, and I'm having a lot of fun with this stuff instead. Right? That's all. Thank you very much.